Hello again and welcome to Mormon Stories podcast on my multi-part interview with John Hamer about the history of the community of Christ. Please join us uh, at, on YouTube at youtube.com slash Mormon Stories for the wonderful visuals that John Hamer provides to chronicle this history. But you can also listen in the audio format. Uh, we've covered John's story. We've covered... Um, how he left the Elders Church and came back to it. We've covered, not came back to it, but uh, decided to actually join the, the community of Christ. We've talked about, uh, you know, the, the history of the church while Joseph was in it and sort of the succession crisis and the various schisms that emerged immediately following Joseph's martyrdom. And now in part three of this series, we're going to begin talking about the emergence of what was originally called the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as I understand it, John may correct me, and that eventually became renamed to the Community of Christ. So let's pick off, pick up where we left off, John. All right. Well, we had just been talking about how kind of the background of the whole story really behind the success and schism is polygamy. And so... Um, what if you had been in? I, I was talk, trying to talk in a restore here, an idea that uh, if you were part of the branch experience. So if you are sitting around in a little local congregation in uh, Indiana, and you know you're getting the newspaper, you're taking maybe initially the Times and Seasons. At some point or other, uh, there's this interim period with the. Brigham Young where he doesn't even have a newspaper and so because they're busy trying to get to the West uh, you, at that point maybe the missionaries are bringing you Strang's newspaper um, you're not exactly sure you know you're still a believer in the restoration your branch is continuing to meet but you're not exactly sure which one of the headquarters at any given moment you may be face, enjoying one you may be enjoying another but behind this whole thing is polygamy, which you weren't part of um, Nauvoo's inner circle. You never heard Joseph Smith do anything other than publish denunciations of it. Uh, but this thing is constantly coming up everywhere. And so at a certain point, by the time um, of James Strang's martyrdom in 1856, um, you will have, if you were in that branch in the Midwest, uh, and you're presumably an opponent of polygamy, you know, you will have gone from this period where, you know, Brigham Young had been denying that he was doing it, but then suddenly in 1852, he openly says he is, and if you're against it, well, maybe that means you can no longer be affiliated with his church. Uh, likewise, William Smith um, had been continuing to denounce it, but then he gets uh, even excommunicated from his own church for uh, for being caught at it. Strang, you know, had written some of the best denunciations of polygamy maybe for you, but then suddenly now he comes out in favor of it. And so you've gone through this whole time period where you are looking back to, you know, some portion of Latter-day Saint experience that isn't all about polygamy. And all of these headquarters um, uh, seem to now have completely been, you know, gone down this polygamy path that you're opposed to. And so a lot of these congregations then throughout the Midwest that continued to exist there uh, ended up you know, having lost any denominational affiliation. They may well have even been, you know, completely on board with Brigham Young until Brigham Young openly published, you know, that they are, that they are having polygamy in Utah. So Okay. And so uh, two of these guys then, or two of these congregational leaders, um, if we go to the next slide here, I have here what's called the beginnings of a new organization of the church in 1851. Uh, two of these people who are uh, branch presidents or pastors of congregations, one in um, um, in both in Wisconsin, actually, um, Jason W. Briggs and Zenith Gurley Sr., both of them had been affiliated with the Strangite Church, and Jason Briggs even had been um, uh, called to be one of William Smith's apostles when William Smith had his own church organization. And so both of them now um, have found themselves completely without a denomination for their branch to be affiliated with. And so both of them do what you do under those, or what many people do in, in, a, in a religion of uh, personal revelation. They pray about it. And both of them uh, individually and separately felt that they uh, uh, received inspiration or revelation that that they shouldn't have their branch affiliate with any of them and that at some point or other um, uh, specifically they they felt that uh, one of Joseph Smith's sons would eventually emerge to lead the church and and you know restore the church and get rid of the 
stain of polygamy from the church. And so they began to have kind of a new organization, which is to say they work on, on creating through holding general conferences, they work on creating a new denominational structure, a new one of these headquarters organizations that is though based in this case, congregation up, so branches up. So these are branches now that don't have a headquarters and they are coming together uh, through conferences to create a new headquarters structure. Okay. And so if we go to the next map, so we have some of these early centers of uh, congregations uh, in the 1850s that are having conferences with each other, dealing with this problem. How can we continue to be Book of Mormon believers? How can we continue to believe in Joseph Smith and the Restoration, even if we don't believe uh, that polygamy is of God? Okay, and, and polygamy was the biggest differentiator for them. Yeah, absolutely. And so. not wanting to affiliate with the Utah church. Right. And in some cases, you know, specifically it was that message, you know, when, when they got the news that, that Brigham Young said, yeah, yeah, we actually are published. You know, we actually are practicing polygamy. You know, in other words, that they, up until that time, they had believed the leadership, you know, they had just said, well, okay, there's all these exposés, but the leaders are constantly denying that they're involved in this. Um, and so we believe them. And then, and then they felt betrayed when, when the, when the curtain got pulled back and said, no, actually, we are doing this, we were using code words or whatever, they, they felt that they, they felt betrayed in a lot of those cases. And so um, this is the time period when a bunch of different um, reorganizations happen. So in addition to the reorganization that results in the Community of Christ Church, um, this is also when the um, people in Pennsylvania reorganize as the Church of Jesus Christ. These are the people we were descended of Sidney Rigdon's church, but they had been somewhat in affiliation with Brigham Young and or Strang or any of these other leaders until such a time as Young is now openly espousing polygamy. And so then William Bickerton reorganizes that church, and we call it now the Bickertonite Church. And we usually think of that as being the third largest branch of the movement outside of the Brighamites and then the Josephites, which is to say the reorganization. And the same thing happens too at this time period, the Hedrickites. So Granville Hedrick um, in Illinois does the same thing. And those guys end up ultimately moving to independence where they become the Temple Lot Church. But it's this, this is the moment that they all do it because of this, these, all the headquarters is, are openly practicing polygamy at this point. Got it. Okay. Okay, so at the same time, um, we I'm going to bring back in an early leader here who we talked about a little bit during the initial succession crisis, William Marks, in the next slide here. So he had been Nauvoo State President, President of the High Council in Nauvoo, and a close friend of Emma. But he also, in the meantime now, has been a restoration seeker. So he sided, as we mentioned, with Sidney Rigdon's claims and became a Rigdonite. He later was impressed by Strang's claims and became a Strangite and ultimately a Thompsonite. And so now he is continuing to seek. He wants to find you know, the old Mormonism that, that attracted him in the first place. And so he also becomes affiliated with these branches that are coming together to form what they were calling a new organization of the church. Right. Okay, so that's happening there. Okay. So M, so we we'll go back to where Emma is. So the next one, Emma and her family. So after the Exodus, um, Nauvoo, which had never really had a, um, a a well-rounded economy, Nauvoo's economy is one of these things that we're kind of aware of now in the in the post um, real estate bubble meltdown that we've had in in. I guess the global financial meltdown, <laughs> but it's where, you know, but prior to that happening, you know, like the city of Phoenix, fully 30% of the people in Phoenix were involved in the construction of new houses industry. And so this was kind of the economy that Nauvoo had too, which is the economy wasn't based on uh, being important for trade or it wasn't, or they were like an agricultural center or a center of industry, but it was a center that was a, a, a boom town where the, people were employed building houses for all the new converts coming in. So then once everybody leaves, <laughs> there's a, there all, all you're left with in Nauvoo is houses. And so the houses have no value almost at all because it's just a city full of empty houses where there's nothing particularly to do. And so it's a very different experience for, um, um, let's say, Joseph Smith III and his brothers and adopted sister growing up in um, Nauvoo, the ghost town, as opposed to what he would have remembered from early childhood, Nauvoo, this incredible boomtown right okay so um just as a this is for the smith family so we go to the next um slide there's just a nice picture here of um the smith boys and then their stepfather so on the um you know, on the one hand in the you know i think the victorian ideal there's this hope that um the 
the martyr or the prophets or the president's wife is going to just live in in splendid isolation you know like the, the first lady like uh, uh, you know polk's wife um you know ended up continuously just if she lived on 40 years or something after polk had died and and she maintained his memory in the tomb and everything like that well emma had emma didn't have the wealth to do that in this you know she had property in nauvoo the property was worthless uh she needed it was a, a become a rough river town um she had children to raise one of which the youngest one of which david hiram was born posthumously even after joseph smith's death um and so uh the realities of frontier life were that she needed to have an, a stepfather to for the for the children and also to just secure her property and everything like that she married uh lewis bideman and they ended up having uh, a, a very good close relationship in some ways um and some ways uh it, there was more tragedy in the relationship in that he um you know, had some affairs, uh, and uh, but he was good. He was a good stepfather to the kids. So this looks like a rough group of guys. Like if I, <laughs> if I look at their clothes, they don't look all clean and prim and proper. They look kind of worn and a little bit dirty. Is that yeah? Is that fair? Like yeah. Oh, I think so. I mean, they they were not wealthy people. Um, there, there's no. Um, I mean, Navu. Like I said, there. I well, for one thing, they weren't particularly wealthy before. <laughs> Uh, you know, the early saints were not wealthy people. They were poor people. Uh, but then kind of living in the ruins of Nauvoo, they weren't, the, the Smith family was certainly not particularly well off. They were, they had some property. They were able to make um, ends meet to an extent, but not, not living in luxury in any way. So this is Louis Bitterman, which is Emma's second husband, and then yes. the four sons of Joseph Smith and Emma. Right. Okay. Got it. Yep. What a cool picture. That's a really cool picture. Yeah, everyone like should go watch this. Go look at this picture. It's really cool. <laughs> yeah, there's some great. It's too bad that, um, you know, it's like we're like two years away. You know, Joseph Smith like died like two years too early. You know, in terms of pictures, <laughs> right? Because this is really the 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 popular. It was just barely becoming super popular and uh, and available and like, way less expensive, and so we therefore have you know pictures and there's lots of later pictures of Emma. Um, uh, but you know, obviously, it's just a couple years too early to have pictures of of their uh, her husband or and all these boys' father. Got it. So okay, okay. So the experience I mentioned a little bit about um, you know the experience that Joseph the Third had growing up. So um, uh, eleven years old, his his um, father is killed. Uh, the entire community that he's grown up in um, is pretty well wiped out and and scattered and it's not like this was the first time that they'd had to abandon you know that everything had been abandoned he had been born in in kirtland and had moved to missouri and then ultimately had been had to you know walk across the ice with his mom you know as refugees to illinois um so uh and then when he grew up and in, into adulthood uh joseph the third was not living in a Latter-day Saint majority community in any way. He is living with non-Mormons, and he is living with non-Mormons who, in a lot of in a lot of cases, had absolutely um, hated what they felt was the threat that his father, the person who had the, his exact same name, Joseph Smith, um, represented to Republican values uh, in the big R, not in the not in the Republican sense of the Republican Party, but in terms of having a religious leader be in charge of civic institutions. And so all the different threats that uh, people felt that his father had represented, these people are still around and they are Joseph Smith III's neighbors. And so he has to have a very different um, different experience or the lessons he took from the early church is a little bit different than, than let's say, his, his relatives and his um, co-religionists who moved off to Utah and had their own separatist society. His society is completely surrounded by non-Mormon neighbors. Okay, so that's what you mean here by learning to live with neighbors. Joseph Smith the yes. third uh, was surrounded by non-Mormons and and had to had to you know grow up in that environment. Right, and ultimately the people in Nauvoo who are non the new the new settlers, um, they ultimately uh, elect him to be uh, they elect him to be a justice. Uh, so in other words, he's able to get along uh, well enough that here's this, this, his dad had been, you know, for them, the, this represented 
theocracy and you know in other words something they'd be afraid that 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 might even rear its head again and they were afraid a little bit when the reorganization happened <laughs> that that maybe people were going to start moving back to Nauvoo but um but he made it very clear that um the lesson that he'd taken away from the the Mormon non-Mormon conflicts was that uh, the church didn't actually uh, win when it decided to go when it decided to go the militant route so some of these sensibilities that I associate with the community of Christ, more humility, friendship, uh, you know, less exclusivism, less elitism, more broad thinking. Sounds like they kind of start with Joseph Smith the third a little bit. Definitely. So there, and and his mom, right? Right. So and both Emma, it's yeah. with them. In some ways, he's more his mother's son. Sometimes, some in some ways, than his uh, you know, obviously he's a combined combination of the two of them, but. Right. But uh, he definitely retains, you know, her total. She was always completely opposed to polygamy, even if she was willing to work with Joseph occasionally right. on it. Right. Uh, he continued to be a, a outspoken opponent of polygamy his whole life. Uh, then sim simultaneously, though, like you say, the interpretation uh, there was always a, a um, in the for the early church there was there, there was this tension between well, how are we going? Are we going to uh, be Christians and turn the other cheek on these things, or are we going to have to stand up and actually fight for our rights and take up arms? And there was that, they would always waver between the two of those. And the takeaway, um, for in the Smith family anyway, was when we we actually never accomplished anything by taking up arms and attacking our neighbors. Yeah, that always back for We did better when we understood our neighbors and when they understood us. Got it. Okay, great. I love those sensibilities. Okay, so we go to the next one here. So this is a kind of a timeline. Oh, by the way, it's a very different sensibility than Brigham Young's in sort of 1850 to 1890 Utah. You know what I mean? Yes. Where it was sort of defensive and kind of it. it I I I read it or reflect upon it as very defensive, very much circle the wagons, very much we're going to get well, you look, look, back. You look know, at the, look at the temples. Look at the look at the architecture. So, what's the difference in terms of the the immediate thing that jumps out if you look at the difference between the Nauvoo Temple and then the St. George, Manti, Logan, and Salt Lake Temples, the pioneer temples that Brigham Young started building? The temples are castles. <laughs> in other words, the, the, this is not only where not only is it because the the they're they're come out the symbolism of the kingdom, but they're fortresses. Castles are fortresses. You have battlements. These are these are where we're having to defend ourselves. You know, so in other words, we still have this idea that no, what we need to do is separate out and and man the battlements. You know, because we, that that's the that's the, our takeaway from from losing these wars. Not that we not that we need to reach out the hand and and learn to live peacefully with our neighbors, but rather we need to um, ha have a a, a stronger defensive perimeter, you know, to prevent them from attacking us. Or and, and I just want to make sure the listeners know I'm not I'm not judging Brigham Young negatively. No one knows what it must have been like to go through what the early saints went through. Even Joseph Smith the third, yeah, to be kicked out of your home. I mean, so many times, all of your property lost. I mean, it's it's a completely reasonable reaction. To do that. Even Joseph Smith probably didn't experience the same level of trauma, Joseph Smith III, that Brigham Young and, and a lot of those early church leaders would have, right? So, so, well, who knows? I mean, in other words, they're kids. Yeah, yeah, they're kids. As opposed to a leader. But, I mean, you can maybe, I mean, your dad gets killed. I mean, it's a pretty traumatic. That's true. That's true. So, well, um, I'm just saying I'm not judging Brigham Young, and I'm. I, I I'm think saying can, you can always have takeaways that are different. And other people can have. Yeah, right. There's more than one way to look at anything, and the, and that is certainly there's different responses. One are we can let's we still need to do this. This is what we're called to do. We're going to go, and and if they can keep following us, we're going to go where no one will ever follow us. We're going to go live in the desert. Right. <laughs> you know, in other words, that's a completely reasonable response. I'm just saying it's a different response that ended up happening in the Smith family, which is also a response, which is when we gathered, the, the takeaway was when we gathered with, in numbers, when we took up arms, when we um, created the, like the mar armies of Zion, like Zion's camp or the Danites, this is a, this got us into trouble. This is what this provoked our neighbors. And so that was, so those are different takeaways. They're, they're, but they're not saying that one is the right takeaway. This is a different takeaway. Got it. But it's a, but it's definitely different sensibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Love it.
Okay, so now if we go to the next slide here, this is like a timeline of these various, we talked about there being competing church organizations. And so with the exception of Brigham Young, who um, ultimately goes from success to success, uh, and, and whereas he's, his organization maybe is not completely out of proportion to what Strang might have had at Strang's height. So there may be four to five times as many people in Brigham Young's organization than it may be that wherever in Strang's organization, depending on how you'd look at it or how you count it. Some people think it's much closer even, uh, like Steve Shields. Um, in any event, Brigham Young's wins and his organization gets bigger and bigger and bigger, whereas the others um, falter in different ways. So either in Strang's case, uh, where he himself is martyred and his, and his followers are scattered, or in other ways, the different competing leaders died, or um, in Alphaeus Cutler's case by the 1860s is in extremely ill health. Uh, so those other organizations start to dissolve and falter. So you've got this period where Brigham's winning, but, but there are a bunch of people left back in the Midwest that don't support the polygamy. And yep. then you've got all these restorationist branches that started out okay, but over time, they start faltering or fizzling out or their leaders are dying. And so right. there's this vacuum of these branches that don't know with whom to affiliate. Is that right? That's exactly right. Okay. Yep. All right. Got it. So if we go to the next map, we can just see, okay, looking at the Midwest, these are just some of the different places where there were competing headquarters or organizations. As you can see, they're kind of spread all around the Midwest from the eastern portion where Pittsburgh, where Sidney Rigdon and William Bickerton are at through Kirtland and then you know, Michigan with with Strang, Minnesota with um, with Cutlerites, and then uh, you know across down to Missouri, even with the Whitmers. You know, so there's different people spread it all around through the Midwest, essentially. Okay, ripe for an emerging <laughs> unifying institution. Are you anticipating what's going to happen? <laughs> all right. So exactly. So what ends up happening then is then at actually um, a town called Amboy in in um in illinois which is which is really the town that is built um, by the railroads next to this place that had been called palestine grove which was the central stake of william smith's church so it's sort of, sort of like the the um building on the kind of the remnants of the williamite organization uh jason briggs who's this former williamite apostle and then uh, Gurley, who's a fr former Strangite, and all of their congregations sort of come together. They have, and they have this conference in Amboy where uh, they recognize um, uh, Joseph Smith the Third as their um, as the prophet of the church. No, I'm on the slide that says "Gathering the Branches." Is that where yeah. you're talking so about? I don't really miss a slide on that. So anyway, I don't have a slide, but yes. So that's kind of gathering the branches, and so then. Um, Having had that moment, this Anvoy conference, for whatever and that reason, was what year? No what, what year was that? 1860, April 6th, 1860. Oh, April 6th. So we've got the April 6th. It's exactly 30 years, 30 years the after the formation of the original church. We've got a bunch of these branches getting together again in what city and state? Amboy, Illinois. Amboy, Illinois. And uh, so Emma and Joseph III go to this conference. Uh, and at the conference, um, the conference votes to recognize Joseph the third as the prophet uh, of the church and president of the church and then he is ordained to that position by William Marx and other other leaders it'd be interesting to hear I mean I'm sure that there was a lot of talk and planning leading up to that event right yes so I wonder what I'd be curious, we don't need to get into it now, but some sort of critical mass of conversations must have been happening over months or years that would build the inertia that led to that meeting where that where that decision happened. Well, absolutely. So the, so that so those branches and the new of the new organization before that moment of reorganization, um, what they, they had already kind of decided that at some point or other there was going to be a leader that would emerge from the Smith family. And so they were kind of excited and desperate for that. And they and everybody else actually from the Strangites who were also then at that point without a prophet um, and and frankly the um, also the, the Brighamite institution uh, organization, they would people would send periodically um, missionaries to Nauvoo and try to get Joseph III to either move out to Utah or accept leadership of the Strangite Church or accept leadership of the new organization. And his answer to all of that sort of was that he would not um, 
be comfortable doing any such thing unless he himself felt called to do that as a prophet. He's not going to just step forward and say, okay, I'm prophet or president of the church. And so um, there were experiences then for him that he's, he says that he had leading up to this 1860 conference, where um, he, which led him to say that when he got there, he came by a power not his own, that he um, came because he felt called to do that and felt called to go to that conference as opposed to um for example accepting the offer from the strangite church to be prophet of the strangite church or the idea that he could go out to utah and have his place or whatever be be part of the organization ultimately who knows an apostle or whatever he would be made in utah but he must have agreed to, to ascend to this position of leadership before he attended this conference yes in, right they did yes yeah. yeah okay and so part of that was because william marks had affiliated with the the new organization he was somebody that emma trusted um she had held herself completely aloof from all of these organizations and so when marks um i think visited with her or, or wrote to her and, and those kind of things i think that that was part of the reason why um, the fact that Marx had, was affiliated with this and that he was able to explain what was going on that made her comfortable enough to become a member of the reorganization. And that probably, I mean, that all, uh, in addition to whatever um, spiritual manifestations that Joseph III felt that he had, uh, you know, would have, would have contributed to that. You know, I just have to pause and say there's something interesting going on here because you'd think with sort of simplistic interpretations that Joseph dies, the polygamy stuff comes out. No one would believe in Mormonism again or the Book of Mormon, and it would all just kind of fizzle and die. But here you've got literally almost dozens, if not hundreds of little branches that maintain belief in the Book of Mormon. They maintain belief in in some flavor of Mormonism long after Joseph's martyrdom, and they're just hanging around hungry to sort of have it continue in a healthy way. So there's something about either Joseph's legacy or the Book of Mormon itself or just yeah. the inherent human need for religion that just shows how important this stuff can be to people, right? Well, I think absolutely, yeah. So in a lot of cases, not every case was the branch in continuous meeting, you know, in these places. In some places, the... And as we were going to go to that next slide that you're saying, okay, gathering the branches, right? Yeah. So that's just, I'm taking like one little place as an example. So this is Southwest Iowa. So there's all of these little settlements in, in Iowa. This is where, um, the area where across the river from where winter quarters was for Brigham Young's people. This is also Manti down there in the corner. This is where the, the Cutlerite church was headquartered. And then up at the top of that preparation, that's where the Thompsonite church was headquartered. Right. And so different ones of these people had um, either at some point or other been Brighamites or Cutlerites or Thompsonites or even Strangites or who knows what all they had been, but they were old believing Latter-day Saints. Um, some of them had decided that they didn't want to go to Utah. They'd gotten to this incredible farmland. If you were a farmer and you got dragged across Iowa, you might think, well, maybe I'll just stay in Iowa and not go to, you know, not go to Utah where there's this desert where I don't know if I want to, you know, be a farmer in a desert. Or in, in Cutler's case, he said, well, you know, this is just upriver from Jackson County, Missouri. And why would I go all the way across the mountains? Because I just have to come back, you know, within a few years here because right. the second coming is about to happen. And <laughs> if I stay here, I can just get on a boat and go down the river, you know, and there's no reason for me to go out there, you know. And so, Anyway, so there's what these happens is that there's these groupings may not have all been meeting continuously in, in a lot of cases they weren't, um, but uh, there's all these little dots here uh, that I have on this map. These all become um, branches of the reorganization, you know, just in the 10 years following um, the reorganization in 1860. So suddenly there's all these old saints who, like you say, for whatever reason, either because of their um, their belief in the Book of Mormon or they're just their, their just memory of their early Mormon experience and what that all entailed, even if there were parts of it that were bad, they now remember, you know, and where they got kicked out of places. <laughs> they now remember, you know, the good parts of it too. And when they hear the new missionaries from the reorganization coming around and saying, there's Joseph's son, Joseph has come and he's stepped forward and he's leading the church and we're going to restore that old Mormonism that we all knew and felt. It was just a powerful message for people. Oh, that's awesome. Very interesting. Okay. And so I have that picture on there too. I love that we went up. Manti is kind of a cool place to go. And that's one of the few surviving buildings from Cutlerite Manti, not Manti, Utah, Manti, Iowa. So, right, right. Anyway. Okay, cool. Okay. So I mentioned just a brief, so we go to the next slide here. I mentioned um, 
you know, briefly how the paper was the most important thing, and that's really how the branches are all getting connected together. So one of the very earliest things that, um, you know, was crucial for Joseph III's new organization to um, to get going is a new paper. And so they published this um, paper, which, like I said, initially is called the True Latter-day Saints Herald in a very polemical, <laughs> polemical way. These are the true Latter-day Saints, as opposed to which other ones, I wonder, are <laughs> not the true ones. So it's a polemical thing. And then, like I say, right there at the masthead, if you can read it, it says, you know, hearken to the word of the Lord, for there shall not be any man among you who have, save it be one wife, and concubines he shall have none, wow. Book of Mormon, you know? And so that's like... You know, you can tell what they're what they're concerned with, right? The differentiation, <laughs> so, right? Yeah, exactly. The competing product, <laughs> and so that's issue number one. You know, of the Herald. Yeah, that doesn't have those uh, those sensibilities that I referred to earlier. No, no, no. They were definitely um, definitely announcing that they were the true Latter Day Saints and everybody else. You know, the, so initially the new organization is again the one and only true church. So in the that's got it retained that full-time Mormonism, too. So there, yeah, that was definitely the right. argument. Okay, interesting. And the Herald is then continuously published up to this day. Beautiful. Um, okay, so the next one. So uh, initially, Joseph the Third, Emma, and everybody, they, uh, you know, they, Emma continues to live there her, all her life, but the uh, Joseph the Third lived in Nauvoo, which is functionally the headquarters then of the church again for the RLDS church. But uh, because... Nauvoo um, had become a ghost town and had fallen off the central economy of the of the late 19th century. It had no rail connection. Um, if you ever go to Nauvoo now, you know it's like one of the furthest places you can ever go from the interstate grid, right? right. <laughs> so you are not. It's you got to go. You got to really want to go there. It has. It's not anywhere still to this day. It's in the middle of nowhere. Right. Um, and and so uh, if you did if you weren't on a rail line in the 1860s, you weren't anywhere. And so the, they moved to a place nearer to Chicago on the rail line uh, called Plano. And that ended up being the RLDS headquarters um, in the 1860s and 70s. The um, Plano, you know, Illinois. Went, Plano, Illinois. Okay. Yeah. And that's near, again, old, um, old branches that existed in the, right. you know, Joseph Smith second era, okay. junior era. And so it's actually... Um, like a town away from this town called Norway, Illinois, which is um, where the old Norwegian saints had settled in the 1840s, including I had great, 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 great grandparents that were were there, and the, almost all of the people in that branch became Strangites. But anyway, now they're all gathered into the reorganization, and so I have a picture there of the original um, like congregations in Plano built this church called the Stone Church, and it's as you see not very large. It has a cool. Um, uh, holiness to the lord inscription on it just like one of the just like uh like the temples right but the um the reason why it's small is that uh the reorganization and joseph joseph the third despite the fact that everybody all in all these branches one of the th old mormon things that they kind of want to do is they they're excited about gathering like he's going to name a new gathering place and they're all going to move somewhere and he's like you know that doesn't work out so well for us <laughs> Wait, hold your hold your horses folks you know let's let's just build up zion where you are and let's build up the congregations let's have a, a, a more of a congregation-based church than a than a headquarters um gathering church and so plano although it's functionally the headquarters of the church is where joseph the third is it's where the offices of the herald are uh it's where all those kind of things happen it's not a gathering place and so it only has you know central congregations but not in any way is it like what the experience of kirtland or nauvoo got it um the next one here is I, I, this is just kind of a neat um <laughs> slide i like it just because this is picture of these uh, uh elders our lds missionaries in 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 um australia with their gospel wagon uh you can see on there a little bit thing there reorganized church of jesus christ of lds so um the just like in the old time church the they, the missionaries went out in twos and elders and they ran around and and the the went from just a couple hundred people that were affiliated with the new organization in 1860 to you know fairly fairly rapidly regathering in old saints and then going from regathering the old saints to uh, sending out missionaries to new places. And so one of the one of the things that places where our LDS um, missionaries were able to gather in old saints actually is in places like Australia and Tahiti where 
people had been kind of out of contact since the martyrdom or early. And so, right. um, so for example, we have um, kind of seventh and eighth generation members of the church in Tahiti, and there's now an apostle from Tahiti because it's like sort of like the Mormon church in Samoa, you know, where there's just yeah, a yeah. lot of a lot of people in Samoa. Well, anyway, there's Tahiti, there's a lot of our LDS people. Huh, interesting. <laughs> Uh, and in fact, if we go to the next one, um, the, the people were so excited in uh, 1872 or something about all of these Tahitian members that when they make the first RLDS seal, there's a palm tree on there <laughs> to indicate that, you know, that kind of the, this isn't the first one, this is an early, but they kept the palm tree for a while. Anyway, that they, um, that they're indicating that the church is existing more than just, it's not just a U.S. church, you know, it's in Tahiti, it's in Britain and other kinds of places like that. And so, uh, and as another point is on the seal, um, you know, we talked a little bit about this peace strain that ends up being um, kind of central to the RLDS um, focus. So the idea of um, that Joseph the Third has, we have to be able to live with neighbors. This comes through very early on. So the the motto of the church, right from when they first have the, the seal and to this day now, is peace. And uh, and so the the goal is that we you know we may we've been accused of militancy. We had our own um, you know. Uh, militia and legions, but that's that's not the that's not the direction that the reorganized church is going. We're going to take it the other direction, where we our our goal is to be a peace church. Was this seal created when Joseph Smith III was still leader? Oh yeah. How yeah, what absolutely. year what year did he die? Or uh, we'll get. I'm terrible at dates, but anyway, it's it's like 1909. We'll okay. To, so yeah, this yeah. seals this seals got Jesus. You know, a young Jesus. It's a, it's, I, it, I don't know if it's Jesus. It's like the child, right? Oh, so it's this a child. Is the imagery, okay. the child, it, it's like the imagery of the, of the peaceable kingdom. So it's the lion lying down with the lamb. And a child. And then there's the child. And it says peace. And, and it says it's got peace. the olive leaves and, and palm trees. And it's yes. a very, it's trying to say, it's a softer feeling. It's, it's trying to say love and peace, really. Which, you know. Is it, it's, and it's a his, and it's and it goes all the way back really to very soon in the reorganization. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, it's the and there, there's a nice history of the of the seal. Okay. Um. In in the in the journal restoration studies. All right. Beautiful. Okay. Um. Okay. But it's so the next slide. So, but uh, just because. Joseph is, uh, you know, uh, saying, "Let's be cautious. We don't want to gather. When we gather, that's when we offend our neighbors. Every single time we we did a gathering, that was the problem. Uh, nevertheless, um, everybody wants to gather, <laughs> so you know, or a lot of people do. You know, that's just one of the old Latter Day Saint things. Uh, you want to gather together and build up Zion. And so, um, uh, ultimately, Joseph the Third kind of tentatively or hesitantly authorizes a gathering place." but an optional gathering place if people really wanted to in Iowa. And it's named Lamoni um, after the um, king in the Book of Mormon who is, you know, renounces violence, right? So the goal here, again, we're going to gather, but with the, the, the name we're pulling from our restoration heritage here is this peace strain. So Lamoni is going to be um, the, the name that we're, you know, having for this gathering place. Nice. And, and so Lamoni... Um, then becomes the new church's headquarters. The um, it's it's a it's kind of a Zionic experiment with you know the, what they try to do with the early church where people are you know doing agriculture and that kind of thing together in a cooperative agricultural community, and then they move things like the the publishing house for the newspaper and the books and headquarters of the church and that sort of thing ultimately move there, and then it becomes also the place where um, the university is founded. The, the, one, so, the one that Bill Russell's at right now? Yes. Yeah. What's it so called? So Grace, Graceland University. Is in Lamoni, yeah. Iowa? Is in Lamoni, Iowa. Oh. Yeah. And so Graceland is, um, uh, so they very early on, even though it's a very, you know, it's a relatively small denomination, it's just critically important. You know, it's an old Latter-day Saint thing to to value education, right? Yeah, sure. And so way back to the school of the prophets, the school of the of the apostles, everything in Kirtland to the University of Nauvoo that they'd hoped to make, although it didn't actually ever get off the ground. Um, the church is, you know, it's still very small, reorganized church. Um, land is set aside for Graceland College. Um, 
you know, this was before Elvis had Graceland, right? So, now it's, <laughs> so it has nothing to do with Elvis. But anyway, so set aside for Graceland College, which is which is also though set up entirely as a um, it's set us up as a um, independent of the denomination. So it's secular. It's able to um, it it isn't under the control of the denomination. Okay, got it. Okay, so that's a couple slides. I don't know. You can see um, the old brick church is just in Lamoni, that's unfortunately got burned down, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and then Joseph Smith III's home uh, in Lamoni, which is still preserved as a historic site. It's a neat old Victorian house to go visit. Oh, very cool. Okay, if you see though, then on the next one here, that's kind of a map of um, the town of Lamoni. But you can also see in the inset there, um, a map of Lamoni as compared to Plano, Nauvoo, and Independence. Yes. And so, um, if you, I don't have on that map, but if you were to look at where far west Missouri is and where Adam and Diamond are, those are in a line between Independence and Lamoni. Okay. And so if you were to draw a line from Independence to far west to Adam and Diamond, and then you were to just sneak across the border into Iowa, then you'd be in Lamoni. <laughs> you know? So you could see that when they decided to found Lamoni, they found it on the railroad there line, but it's... Um, it's really just across the border and then pointing again at uh, independence, which um, still at the time was so um, critically important for all the factions of Mormonism. So it's hard to even think about it anymore in 21st century LDS church. The people, very few people probably still think, well, pretty soon we're going to pack up the car and move to Jackson County, Missouri. That probably has mostly died out. <laughs> but it was definitely, the people definitely believed that that was going to happen. Um, in the in the late 19th century right yeah even you know I, I think that a lot of the saints in the LDS church up until 1890 were were really thinking the second coming was, was right around the corner right yeah, absolutely for sure yep yeah and so um, so again I think Lamoni's location is with that thinking in mind yeah got it Okay. So they're not in Missouri, which is dangerous to be in, but they're across the border in the safest, in the closest place in Lamoni. Right. In Iowa. Interesting. But people did start going back. Um, so you can stop people from wanting to go back to Jackson County. And once the um, Temple Lot Church guys, once the Hedrickites um, came back and reclaimed the very center part of the Temple Lot, where the traditional location of the, the, the dedication of the one temple site was, there's supposed to be 12 temples built. And so they, it's not the whole thing, but it's a portion of the Temple Lot. And it's, a, it's that portion, which is the traditional location for the dedication of the first temple that happened in 1831. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so uh, once they came back and they didn't seem to get killed by Missourians, um, then every people in the reorganization decided, well, we, it's, it's okay for us to go back too. And several of them had revelations to go back. And so they started to move to independence as well. And so the next picture there is um, the Stone Church, which was built in 1888, just across the street from the Temple Lot Church. And so it's one of the early it's a home for the or a congregate early congregation of the um the reorganized church is that still around oh yeah and yeah. it's still it's owned by the community church. of christ oh yeah it's a beautiful church it's um was one of the central congregations for a whole long time it's still it still is it's across the street from the uh it's across the street from the temple Lot and kitty corner from the temple from the L lds the community of christ the community temple. of christ temple the okay. lds temples up by um Liberty, Liberty Jail. It's up in that area, up north of the river. Okay. It's not in Independence. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, so we talked a little bit about, um, you asked me about Joseph III. Was he still around? And kind of, yeah. <laughs> you know, all through that late date. I'm, I'm terrible at dates, but here we get to the slide. So here's the date, 1914. So um, he was in semi-retirement towards the end, but he um, was president of the church for 54 years. <laughs> And so, as you could imagine, he put a real stamp on um, the whole RLDS identity. Um, yeah. uh, his biographer, uh, Rich, uh, Roger Lanius, calls him the pragmatic prophet. Um, he was he had a uh, he was actually pretty successful at bringing together old members who had followed all these different diverse leaders and had different beliefs. So it's not like again that Strang or Thompson or um, uh, Whitmer or anybody else's um, 
beliefs in the meantime at, between the martyrdom and the reorganization, it's not like they hadn't come up with a whole bunch of new things. So the Strangites, for example, um, had become are, and still are Seventh Day Sabbatarians. So they believe that the Sabbath is Saturday, oh. and and they worship on Saturday. Well, so Herald House, which is to say the Community of Christ, the RLDS printing house, actually actually published a book about why. The Lord's Day is Sunday, right? <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, in other words, there's like a lot of different new beliefs in Scripture and everything else that all of these different paths, you know, had all had, including some of the things in the last period of Joseph Smith himself's uh, ministry that um, that Joseph the Third had to kind of bring it all back together and weld that into an actual functional church, which is really quite a remarkable feat. And one of the ways he did that was he had kind of a strategy of waiting out old members. Um, and so if you really, really were somebody who believed, let's say, you really felt that the Book of Abraham ought to be one of the standard works, if you thought, and Joseph III didn't feel that that needed a place in the canon, um, he, you would be adamant about it. And what he'd say is, well, it's not important for as a test of membership, let's just talk about that later. Right. And then, uh, and then they, and then you die. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, and then, and then later never happened you know <laughs> so we never did talk about that later you know and so then you know fast forward to 1968 and you were you're not having any problem that it turns out the book of abraham you know isn't a, isn't a true translation you know in other words because it's not in the canon so so that ended up working out you know but anyway so that's kind of one of the ways that he was able to do that so he what he did was he kind of created a vision of the kind of Kirtland Missouri period of Mormonism he didn't take it all the way back he never said that his father was a fallen prophet but he definitely you know pruned back all the kind of later Nauvoo developments by kind of saying well those aren't tests of faith you can believe that all you want but we just not going to emphasize that and we're not writing that in the newspaper you know I wonder so why that, he didn't adopt uh, you know eternal marriage you'd think You'd think that'd be something. Eternal, eternal marriage is polygamy. I mean, I mean, I, the, I mean, we now say in the Mormon Church has gotten rid of polygamy, and so you talk about celestial marriage as if celestial marriage has one iota of sliver of difference between polygamy. But it is the same. It is it. it, it celestial marriage is equals polygamy. That's what that means. That was, it, it, it's only after the Mormon Church abandoned polygamy that they created an idea of celestial marriage apart from polygamy. Oh, okay. So in my uh, wait a minute. So, like, uh, you couldn't get sealed in the temple in a non-polygamous way prior to 1890. It, I'm sure you could. <laughs> the but the doctrine itself was promulgated. The whole the whole thing there, celestial marriage. When you said celestial marriage, that meant plural marriage. So, in other words, you could maybe have done it once, but the doctrine was that you needed to ha you needed to have plural marriage. And so the people who were, were bought into the doctrine of celestial marriage in the 19th century were the people who, you know, um, were the proponents of polygamy. Hmm. I'm just thinking that this idea that the families are eternal and that marriage lasts beyond the grave, that feels like a really strong selling point for the modern LDS church. Well, I can just say flam families can very well no one believes that you are separated in afterlife right so that is that that's it that there aren't um it's manufactured aren't scarcity you're saying it's it's yeah man exactly there are not christians who believe in an afterlife who believe that they'll be separated from their loved ones in the afterlife jesus has a thing that is in the gospels where it's recorded there in the you know in the kingdom of my father they're neither married nor given in marriage but that doesn't mean that um and that's just a teaching that Jesus happened to have said, right? Or, or it was recorded as if he said that, <laughs> depending on, you know, we'd have to look at the exact thing. But, um, but that doesn't mean that um, anybody believes they're separated from their loved ones in, the a in an afterlife. It means that um, people have a, uh, maybe a different conception of what afterlife is going to be about than just more of the same this life, right? Okay, that that explains why there's no uh, celestial marriage in the reorganized church or community of Christ. What about proxy work for the dead? And what about uh, endowment? Any idea why that wasn't uh, perpetuated? They had a lot of, um, so there was a lot of potential for proxy work for the dead. So um, sometimes, 
and I think sometimes on local levels, people were doing baptisms for the dead. Baptisms for the dead was something that had been done a little more generally in Nauvoo and before the temple was created. Uh-huh. Um, and some people did feel that that was important. And so I think people were occasionally doing that. Um, in the in the RLDS church? In the RLDS church, but not Joseph III. So that wasn't something that was... A, critical on at the headquarters level there was still a question when the revelation came to uh, build revelations early revelations came to build the temple in independence there was still a question of whether or not the temple would be a place of doing baptisms for the dead and um, the answer the dnc's uh, revelations are about those things is that it would not be in other words that that was something that uh, was meaningful to people in Nauvoo but it doesn't doesn't have to have been continued in any way, um, and and the 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 um, the reason for it, uh, the reason why it isn't, uh, I think it isn't theologically necessary, is that I I, I think that um, baptism uh, isn't it, it isn't a it, it is I would say for me anyway I'm just gonna say I can't speak for the church baptism isn't a a saving ordinance that has that someone has to actually have done in order for something to happen what is the mechanism when you get baptized on earth what is the what is the thing that absolutely happens in some kind of heavenly calculus that meant that you had to have done that that particular act um and that it, unless you have actually physically done that uh there there's a, there's something meaningful didn't happen and I think that it is, is it's an ordinance, it's something that you do to make, you can have all kinds of wonderful um, reasons to do it, and which is why I um, uh, decided that I wanted to be baptized into Community of Christ. I could have waited just a little bit of time because now Community of Christ um, accepts anybody's Christian baptism. Uh, if you wanted to join, we, the church, John, you've been baptized uh, as a in the LDS church, and now to be a member of Community of Christ, you would only have to um, be confirmed a member. But uh, be, I, I chose to be baptized because, for me, baptism is a public idea of being reborn publicly with your congregation, with your denomination, to saying, I am part of this movement, this movement is valuable to me. But you can, the same way that you can be married without having the traditional um, uh, ceremony of walking down the aisle, you can also, in my opinion, be baptized without having uh, been immersed in water because I don't think that there's some kind of a, a celestial mechanism to make anything actually happen when when that or when that public uh, symbolic act happens. You could be baptized just as well by saying you were baptized or writing signing a piece of paper. Any um, any idea why the endowment wasn't adopted by Joseph Smith the third? Um, I mean, again, it's one of the things that's associated with the plural marriage. So it is one of the secret, yeah. it was, uh, you know, it's one of the secret practices. Um, uh, I, I'd have to, I don't know. I don't know anything more than that than as, as why it wasn't. Um, I think that, uh, the endowment is something that, uh, so it's a nav, it's a Navu practice. It's different. It didn't take place in Kirtland. And so Joseph the third is kind of dialing things back to an earlier stage. Okay. Uh, of Mormonism, um, I think that for the um, uh, the endowment, I think it could be a a, a very meaningful. Uh, I'm, when I was saying talking about baptism for the dead, I think baptism for the dead can be a meaningful ordinance for the living. So if if baptism for the dead, if you do baptism for the dead, uh, where you are personally being baptized for like an ancestor or for a pioneer that was important to you, like for example, um, the um, I think it was. Linda Newell, who was baptized for Jane Manning, oh, you know, cool. so it was just just that could be intensely powerful, right? For um, uh, Linda Newell, but I don't think it's essential for Jane Manning to have done that herself. So, in the exact same way, I think that the endowment um, could still be a very um, spiritually meaningful uh, spiritual practice, but it isn't something that is a saving ordinance that's essential. Right. And what I hear you say is that the more associated it was with Nauvoo, the less eager Joseph Smith III is likely to be to adopt it. Exactly. Yeah. And and just real quick, three degrees of glory, does that stay or not stay? Uh, that was definitely, that was, you know, that's part of the canon. Okay. And it still is. Okay, okay. And it was definitely, um, it was definitely taught all through the 20th century. If you look at um, RLDS preaching charts and all these kind of things, um, I'd say that now, uh, 
by and large, people would see that as as being symbolic. Yeah. yeah. You know, as opposed to, I don't think people think that if you were are, um, you know, only so good or whatever that you're going to be in a terrestrial kingdom, and that means that you're you're forever locked there for all eternity, and you can't ever. Right. In other words, so I think that that part of it, um, and a kind of a literal aspect of it, um, isn't isn't particularly widely um, preached about in the RLDS, the Community of Christ today. Although I'm sure some people do. Okay, so back to accomplishments of Joseph Smith the Third. Sorry about that. Keep going. Well, that's fine. Yeah. So he, I mean, ultimately, people always ask me, you know, if you know, you you talk about all of these this history of schism and Mormonism. Does is there any example of of um, coming together, and 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 it's hard to do that. But Joseph the Third really does a good job at that. So he brings the reason why there are so few Strangites today is because almost everybody who was a Strangite became a member of the reorganization. The Whiteites are extinct today because they all became uh, members of the organization. There's only six Cutlerites today because almost all of Cutler's descendants that are part of the Restoration are in Community of Christ. So a lot of these different different um, competing organizations are all successfully gathered in and Joseph Smith the thirds um, this thing of actually the danger that people have when they peel back the onion and they keep going back and back and back well he's able to fix on a on a uh, kind of a common vision that doesn't get pulled back too far uh, and so it, it's able to be successful and so in the course of his lifetime um, there is or his ministry as the uh, president of the church, the population of the RLDS church goes from 300 to 72,000, which is a pretty good run <laughs> in yeah. terms of increase. Yeah. Uh, he himself was personally the editor of the Herald, which I've been, pointed out is a really important way for how the church just communicated with anybody. Um, very early on in, in the, in, after the organization, while the, while the operations are still so tiny, they're actually able to publish, um, uh, Joseph Smith's Bible revision, what the in the Utah Church is called the Joseph Smith translation, and what the reorganization calls the inspired version of the Bible, which is kind of a huge undertaking to take all of the revisions to finish the manuscript and publish an entire book as long as the Bible, and so that was done. Um, there were uh, I mentioned here on this list it says Orders of Enoch, but essentially continuing with the communitarian experiments of, of working together uh, in economic cooperatives that was done in the early church, the founding of the of the university. Um, he adds uh, 17 revelations, which have been canonized in the in the Community of Christ um, DNC, including um, in 1865 the one on blacks and the priesthood. And what does it say? That, what does that say? Um, it says that blacks can have the priesthood. Awesome. Does it say why they didn't ever have it to begin with? Um, I think it's a confirmational one. I don't think it says that blacks didn't have it. Right. I think it says that um, uh, that black people can have the priesthood, but it's it again is pragmatic, so it advises caution. Don't just you know don't be hasty and, and ordain every single person. But you know we have to just take this slowly. Um, it was done in the wake of the Civil War, right? So yeah. it, the confirmation is happening when uh, when black people are by and you know, are, you know there's no more slavery, right? Was, and so it's 96 years before the LDS Church, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then ultimately, he um, he himself regathers to Zion, so um, lives his last years in Independence. Kind of a so, remarkable leader, huh? Yeah, yeah. No, I think so. Absolutely. Okay. And okay, so the next slide here, um, I have here kind of dueling cousins. So his first cousin, who is Hiram Smith's son, Joseph S. Smith, um, uh, is his you know kind of direct contemporary, six years younger, um, and uh, and and Joseph F. Smith ended up being president of the LDS Church, you know, in an overlapping time period, 1901 to to 1918. I wonder if they ever hung out, you know, talked. They, 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 yeah, they really hated each other. Really? <laughs> yeah, did not get along well. So, yeah, so. Um, That's so sad. I know. I mean, I'm just imagining yeah. my first cousins, you know, I love them, right? Like, yeah, they mean a lot to me, my first cousins. Well, it, you know, we talked about it in my story, you know, like having, putting um, uh, family before church. Well, this is an example of church before family between the two of them. So, yeah, that's too bad. Um, you know, I mean, Joseph the Third is a, just a, uh, incredibly hostile to polygamy. Uh, Joseph S. Smith was um, a poster uh, child. <laughs> yeah, poster child. Yeah, exactly. And then, so, so, uh, so, so, Joseph the Third was was you know hostile to Joseph F. Smith's 
you know actual family relationship which is threatening on the you know just me you know what whatever in other words that's already hostile uh conversely joseph s smith um was really assigned by brigham young when joseph the third emerged as kind of a leader and he's sent out to he goes he decides to go out to utah on missions and things like that joseph s smith is really kind of sent to sent around to dog him to remind people well, we have smiths too and 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 to to say that you know i don't know that m is a liar and this kind of thing well, well I don't know if you've done this, but I'd be fascinated to know what was the what was the community of Christ or the reorganized church ever considered to be a legitimate, significant threat to the ongoing viability of the Utah LDS church? And do you know at what point in history when the chasm in terms of size between the two churches was the smallest in terms of a difference? Well, so go to the next slide. Okay. <laughs> okay. So oh, got it. Here's uh, a, that was my question. <laughs> yeah. So here's the relative thing. So in 1860, the RLDS church is nothing, right? And the LDS church has got 80,000 people, let's say. And so then uh, these are all the population figures for Mormon churches are never any good. But these are kind of what the self-reported numbers. And so this is – they're both they're – both in both cases wrong right <laughs> but anyway right, right. so um but you can see then by the time uh, when the two of them um are presidents obviously the lds church still dwarfs the rlds church but it's not like it is today where the the incredible post war uh, growth in numbers of the LDS Church and the you know relative stagnation of Community of Christ has meant that the two churches are just like worlds apart now, like we showed. They were much closer, you know, at this turn of the century, the turn of the nineteenth um, to twentieth centuries. Okay, yeah. So it was about a, a sixth of the size of the LDS Church at its at its relative peak. Right, uh, in terms of the two of the, them, and so what the. Um, and then what I'd say is in terms of the – as a viable um, or at least a semi-scary thing for the the hierarchy, it's the immediate um, time, though, at the beginning of that when Joseph III first, you know, uh, emerges as, as a, a, a claimant and, you know, claims his father's mantle. That's the – that was really the danger zone probably because um, – at that time, you know, when they first got out there, there were a lot of old time members um, in, you know, who maybe were dissatisfied with uh, theocracy or anything that was going on in Utah and were potentially very amenable to nostalgia of that old charismatic Joseph Smith. And here is his son who looks like him, especially some of his brothers looked exactly like his, their dad. Uh, and they're the missionaries that are sent out there. And so um, I think it's. I'd argue, and I think it kind of the case is sort of made in um, in Quinn's book that it's that moment that Brigham Young, um, who may have been on course to want to create his own kind of dynasty, and so he wanted to have Brigham Jr. or one of his other sons succeed him. Um, it's kind of that moment uh, in the face of this threat um, uh, that, that the Smith boys are now f kind of having that the other succession model is definitely fixated on. In other words, we have to go back and legitimize what Brigham Young did. So we have to say, you know, kind of very clearly that um, that it's always the head of the Council of Twelve Apostles that has the right to succeed. We can't say it's gonna, a kind of thing that happens father to son, because if it happens father to son and Brigham Jr. is going to become the next um, president, what does that say about Brigham's dynasty in the first place? It's a, he's a usurper, <laughs> right? And so I think that it ultimately is the RLDS church that ends up fixating the LDS succession method that ends up happening and that you're locked into to this day. Which has probably been a pretty important factor of success for the LDS church because it prevents succession crises, right? And I don't think oh, yeah. I don't think yeah. blood lineage lasts anywhere into the 20th century even even in Great Britain it's just symbolic. And so blood lineage oh, yeah. just isn't the way to go, you know. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm no I I'm not an advocate of it yeah, at all. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but but what I'd say is that, you know, when you're looking at this little thing, eighty thousand versus three hundred, right? Then you think, why would they have any impact at all? But I think that they had an enormous impact right there. And so that's when you have to have these memories that there was the transfiguration of Brigham Young, he became like Joseph. That the that the that the first presidency's always dissolved. That they're you know, that they're that and that and then that also prevents Brigham Young from um, 
being able to have his son succeed him the way he may have wanted. Yeah, that's fascinating. All right. Okay. So, okay, in that course of that time period, um, now that um, the LDS church now has settled into the kind of succession the way it does, the way they had to kind of tool back. On the one hand, they took the inner core of Nauvoo practices and then brought them all out, but then had to tool back and by 1890, um, at least um, publicly abandon polygamy and then later actually abandon polygamy. Uh, and then let's look just like, again, to the to the end of Joseph III's um, at ministry. Um, we can just kind of look at the diverging paths kind of up to 1910 between the two churches. So I'd argue that what happened in the LDS church is these core beliefs in Nauvoo were brought into practice for all members, but later we can't begin to have these accommodations by purging kind of these unpopular beliefs, as you mentioned. Um, whereas on the RLDS church, what happens here is you bring this diverse groups of old saints together with different beliefs, and then there's a kind of a purge of all Nauvoo innovations and a focus on a kind of Kirtland Mormonism. And so then we're left at that point then with these beliefs that include in, in, in the LDS church, uh, kind of Nauvoo theology, which includes um, progression theology, eternal progression, and multiple gods kind of theology, the Nauvoo endowment and baptisms for the dead, celestial slash plural marriage, which is later just celestial without the plural marriage, uh, the book of Abraham, and then this new compilation, the Pearl of Great Price, are canonized, and tithing, for example, is on income. And in the RLDS church, there's this total opposition to polygamy is, is the core of the identity, which is in a way a negative identity where we're kind of yelling at our right. top of our lungs what we're not, right. which is n never necessarily a positive thing to be doing. Uh, but then keeping, for example, building Zion, so united or orders, and also you know an emphasis on wanting to go back to Jackson County and actually going to Jackson County, kind of a, a Trinitarian um, godhead that, that is kind of like a Kirtland theology. Um, also having hold of the inspired version of the Bible, uh, continually adding um, sections to the Doctrine and Covenants, and then this kind of new thing of pulling the strain of peace as opposed to militancy out of the early experience. You know, two things that just occur to me that I would guess would have been difficult for the RLDS Church at some point, although maybe it wasn't, but one is that a lot of these Nauvoo teachings can be viewed as quite beautiful you know the the expansive view of of heaven and and of gods the the eternal progression of mankind and our our potential to become like god again the endowments um you know celestial eternal marriage like that's some say that's some of the best stuff that, you know the 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 lds church offers in terms of theology it's some of the most ennobling and inspiring and motivating like, I, I wonder if that was ever hard for the RLDS church to not go there. But even more importantly, since they still, you know, clearly if blood lineage is important, there's a reverence to Joseph. And if that's where Joseph took things, there's got to be some gravity to say, let's stick with that because Joseph's still awesome. And, and the, <laughs> uh, the older he got, you know, this is more this could have been great revelation and we're going to, we're going to like cut that off and say, you know, we love Joseph, but only up until 1838 Joseph, you know? And right. it, I imagine, I don't know if that was hard for them, but I imagine that would have been hard for me to, to cut off those doctrines that many of you is beautiful and to sort of limit part of Joseph's most mature, in some ways, spiritual gifts or inspirations. Well, I think you're right. No, but I would. I guess my point would be, though, let's say if you are already coming at this from this ancient order of things, and Joseph is like, like you're saying, by cutting anything that you're doing with Joseph Smith, you're cutting off part of Joseph. Smith. That's right. <laughs> and so, and so, <laughs> it is still. You know, we don't. You don't have the council of 50 you don't have the kingdom so you don't have the last and you also then have to cut off all of the early theology if you're keeping the late that's theology. right we're, you have to, we're doing it too you're saying <laughs> yeah so you, you have to it's a grab bag you have to identify certain things you know there you aren't all living in um agricultural communes you know in zion or whatever in other words there's these different things that are yeah. that are critical uh like adding new sections to the dnc but so how do how do you accomplish like having for example getting rid of late nauvoo stuff well one thing is um 
none of almost none of that um, ha, it makes its way into scripture in terms of Joseph Smith's revelations. If you go into the Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith material, even including um, mostly stuff that's been at that was added later to the LDS portion, almost everything that Joseph has in in revelations is actually coming from the Kirtland and Missouri periods, especially Kirtland. And so if you like look at if you do like a pie graph and say, well, how, where where are, are um, all of these DNC scriptures, they're all taking place in New York and Kirtland, you know. And so it's very, it's in that way. If you're kind of focusing on Joseph, the uh, producer of scripture, and if you were looking at, you know, fundamentally the Book of Mormon at the uh, Joseph Smith translation, which again is primarily um, dated from. Uh, 1830 to 18, 1831 to 1833 period. Uh, if you're looking at all of these revelations that make their way into the Doctrine and Covenants, these are um, you're going to get an earlier Joseph Smith than if you were focused, if you were having to rely on um, memories of kind of practices and teachings that are done in secret but not published. And so it is, it is an, it, there is actually kind of a natural way to do that. I mean, you have to look, you have to look pretty hard to have the King Follett. Um, progression doctrine taught in any kind of writings of Joseph Smith, right? Right. So it's very rare. It's not in you. People look in vain in the Book of Mormon to find eternal progression, or to in the DNC even to find much of it. There's a couple things that are kind of mentioned in the polygamy revelation, but otherwise it's not particularly easy to find that theology in the in the actual printed scripture. And so that's one of the reasons why people have kind of talked about well in this um, this triptych. Uh, whatever it's called, the uh, or the um, I'm not sure in the in the as um, as God is right the couplet you know man the couplet, what, the couplet yeah. that's what, yeah that that half of the couplet has maybe fallen out of contemporary LDS Mormon theology. In other words, that people aren't necessarily be, people are now being taught that yes, you can become godlike, but it isn't necessarily clear. It's maybe not in the manuals and maybe not preached from the pulpit in, in conference, whether or not God was once a man with a mortal body on a regular planet like earth. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's you true. Know? And so, um, that may be a, a little bit of dialing back that's happening right now. Sure. It's hard to know. I mean, sure. Gordon Hinckley said he didn't know much about it, but then he later said he did know about it. But anyway, so, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say it's not in the manual anyway, I guess. Yeah. And I, I, I see what you're saying. I guess all I'm saying is that once you accept Joseph as a prophet, as an inspired, as and as this awesome guy, it's it'd be hard not to view his Nauvoo stuff as his most exciting, cutting edge stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It certainly is exciting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I guess I would say yeah. you have to have a different view, and I would have a different view of what a prophet or a person that is right. uh, writing scripture are. I don't think of um, prophets or apostles. Uh, theological speculation as being authoritative. So Paul has all kinds of ideas. The Apostle Paul in the ancient antiquity has all kinds of ideas, um, some of which are in incredible. He's a really smart guy and he, you know, has all kinds of wonderful visionary stuff. But I mean, I, he also has stuff that I completely don't agree with. Yeah, and, right. and and we shouldn't say that that means he's was a fallen apostle or any other thing. But anyway, so we have to just look at everybody in their own context and and look at what they're doing and find where it is meaningful to us in the church today and where right. uh, where it isn't. Now, and even where it needs to be condemned. Now, th this feels like a natural place for the break. Should this next slide be the end of our discussion, or should we, or should we chop now and then and then start with the next slide? It looks like the next slide is kind of a. Yeah, I just want yeah, it's a sum up. Okay, so let's let's sum up with the next slide. Okay. All right. So, you know, you're talking. So this last thing here, I just want to have, um, is this kind of way if you look at it, how much we're all still as a religion or had been at least for a century or more trapped in 1844. And we can see it in this idea of the succession theory just played out and how that affected the church. So if we take, um, as we mentioned, the LDS church, what happened in 1844 is the senior most apostle um, became the new head of the church, which um, oppo he opposed the first you know, the surviving first presidency member. And so in practice then, in the LDS church, there was another couple um, 
interregnums that you know when Brigham Young died there was a little bit of a of, of again an interregnum but what ended up happening is the first presidency dissolved uh, and the senior most apostle succeeded which has resulted in um, a very old leaders always being in charge of the LDS church right the, we look for the strength the, ger the gerontocracy yeah yes yeah. <laughs> so yeah exactly and so in some cases obviously um, a head of a head of the church who you know may not be in a um, fully you know with us right? right so it might be just medically not there like Ezra Taft Benson for a while right so um, and certainly not inclined to be socially progressive on social issues that may well be also one of the reasons why for the difference between where the two churches have gone. Right. Yeah. And so looking at Strang, uh, Strang's group, so Tr Strang um, was appointed successor. He claimed that he was ordained by angels in his, in his later um, revelations, said that the apostles totally didn't have the authority to do what Brigham Young did. In other words, if he, he, there's actually scripture, Strangite scripture, that says if you were to do that, you would be in apostasy. So it turns out, Brigham Young, you're apostate, according to Jerry Strang. Right. <laughs> you know, but, so the result that happened, though, was he, when he was martyred, he appointed no successor. Uh, for anybody to be considered a successor uh, in the Strangite church, they require you know, announcing that they've been angelically ordained. And specifically, Specifically, all of the remaining Strangite apostles were not authorized to leave the church, and the result has been that there has been no successor. Yeah. So the church continues now and hasn't had a prophet since the first two, yeah, right. Joseph Smith and James Strang. Right. And then finally then, too, um, locked in the community of Christ. So uh, the appointment of successor, so the idea that um, Joseph Jr. had appointed his son at some point to succeed him, uh, appointment ends up being the succession means. Uh, in this case, it was the son of the predecessor that, uh, ended up succeeding, and obviously apostles don't have the right to succeed, and so in practice then that happened again. So Joseph III appointed his own son, the son is a successor, the first presidency continues, the first presidency has nothing to do with apostles. The apostles are a totally different group from the first presidency in their RLDS church. And it turns out in the end that models of succession really matter. It does, that totally affected the whole history of the three different churches and and very different things have resulted yeah